listening to the Humans vs. Retirement podcast with financial planner and retirement specialist, Dan Haylett. In this podcast, Dan explores ways to help you overcome the behavioural, emotional and financial challenges of life after work. Join Dan for the journey where he will explore how our wonderful human brain will naturally fight against what it takes to live a happy, healthy and wealthy retirement. Dan will draw on years of expertise, experience and expert guests to solve the behavioural, emotional and financial challenges of life after work. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to the Humans vs Retirement podcast. I'm your host, Dan Haylett. And today I am super excited to be joined by my great friend, Mr Neil Bage. Um, Now, the reason why I am so excited is... Every time I have a conversation with Neil, I get so many light bulb moments that that uh, that, that come up, and I know that's what you guys, as listeners, uh, are going to experience today. So, I just want to briefly say why is Neil here? Neil is here because he is, without doubt, one of the world's leading experts on the subconscious behaviours that drive our decisions and is renowned for bridging that complex scientific theory. So hopefully we're not going to get too long of words today. Um, (laughs) So it's a complex scientific theory with real world understanding, and especially when it comes to our decisions that involve money. Now, Neil is a co-founder of Shaping Wealth, a wonderful learning platform that is truly transforming the human experience of money. Neil, welcome to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Dan, thank you for having me on. I mean, you've kind of set me up for a fail with such an amazing introduction, right? Because now I've got to perform at the highest level possible. So um, let's let's see if I can. Hopefully I can. I've got no doubt. I've got no doubt. (laughs) Um, So really, I just want the listeners to get a brief understanding of you, your journey. Um, You've got a very interesting journey that we won't cover off in in half an hour. Um, But I'd love just to get a sense of, uh, you know, you know, why you're here and where you've come from. That'd be wonderful. So let me do the the kind of the very short version of a very, very long journey, um, an amazing life journey. But um, and all of our life stories amazing, right? So I left school, studied to be a PE teacher. Um, doing that, I specialized in two areas, human biology, so physiology and um, sports psychology. So, and it was then that I fell in love with what goes on inside the human brain. And how the human brain can derail us from, you know, the most admirable paths that we choose to take. Um, Realised I didn't want to be a PE teacher and left the town that I was born in. I was born and raised in the northeast of England. I left there to seek my fortune without knowing at all what that fortune was going to be or what I was going to do in life. And then fell into the world of financial services um, purely by accident. I realized early on, actually, this is an entire head game. Everything here is about psychology. Everything is about how people make important decisions, not necessarily about, you know, from the sports world, but just how they make important decisions about money. And I started to fine tune my understanding of what goes on inside people's brains when they are making important financial decisions. I started that journey kind of 20, 25 years ago. Um, And I've never looked back, Dan. And then in the last maybe 15, 10, 15 years, I've kind of pivoted that to more applied neuroscience. So understanding the real detail of what goes on inside people's brains and how that impacts the way that they create and form emotions and decisions and habits, um, but always with a lens or through a lens of um, money. So it's been an interesting journey and it's led me to sitting here today, looking at your face, talking to you. How amazing, eh? Uh, it's pretty cool, right? Pretty cool, and 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 I think that that um, you know the understanding that we plans are wrong the moment that we think of them, and the journey that we go on, and you know that I think that's something that we talk to a lot of people about. We, you know, you, you've talked to me a lot about this, and we talk to our clients a lot about that journey. That the plan is wrong the moment it's created, and we don't know what tomorrow brings, and the journey is exciting, and the destination is never ending, and so. Um, yeah, it's uh, that's a very short version of I know what is a very very long story. Yeah. Um, so, what what I what I love to talk to you about, and we we obviously had a, a discussion before hitting record here. Hmm. Um, but what I'd love for you to share with the listeners is what you think as 
human beings, crucial phrase there, not as calculators or not as uh, spreadsheets, but as human beings and the evolution of our brains and how they work, what do you think is one of our greatest challenges when it comes to this modern day, modern world retirement? So there's probably two strands I can go down here. The first one is the kind of the more obvious one, which is all about a sense of meaning and purpose. You know, there's an important fact here about retirement that I don't think gets talked about enough. I might be wrong in that statement, by the way, but I feel like it's not talked about enough in that we, you know, we've got a school, we've got a college, university, we get a job, whatever. And for the majority of our life, we, we work. In other words, we get up every day and we have purpose. We, we go to work and we do something and hopefully that purpose has meaning and we, and we love what we do and and we get paid, which is a reward for the for the, the effort we put in and all of that type of stuff, right? We Everybody listening knows what that is. But we have meaning and we have purpose. And then all of a sudden, some day arrives when we don't need to go to work anymore. So you wake up one day, and if that was all you did, then your meaning and your purpose have gone overnight. You wake up, and they're gone. Now you've got no purpose to get out of bed for. You've got no meaning. And so one of the challenges we face in retirement is ensuring that we have purpose, that we have meaning, that we have something to get out of bed for. I see this time and time again. I see this, I've seen this across my own family. People retire and then kind of just sit on a chair and think, I don't know what to do with my time because they've just spent 40, 50 years knowing exactly what to do with their time. So they have, it's almost as if they had no time on their hands. Now they've got all the time on their hands. They had no autonomy because they were always told what to do in the workplace. Now, all of a sudden, they've got complete autonomy. And it creates a bit of a messy situation in the head. It's, it, it's a really difficult cognitive, psychological barrier to get over. And I feel that we don't talk about that challenge enough. We kind of go, yay, you've retired. Oh, my God, you can do whatever you want. And people go, brilliant. How amazing is that? And then they wake up in the morning and think, oh. Now what do I do? And so I think part of your job, you know, the role of financial planners around the world is to help people before they retire understand what that path looks like. That, you know, when they reach this day, whatever that day is, ensuring that they still have some sense of purpose, some sense of meaning to, to, to get out of bed and just live a life that is, you know, fulsome and, and happy and meaningful. So th that's one strand. The second strand, which I won't go into in any depth because I will be here for five hours if I do, is What's going on actually inside the human brain? You know, th this thing is constantly receiving inputs from the world around us, you know, through our senses, you know, so tight, um, you know, touch, taste, smell, sight, all of that, our main senses. The human brain is just taking in electrical impulses all the time. Those electrical impulses create our reality. So that's how we perceive the world through our senses. And when we create that perception or our subjective reality, it's from there that we create our emotions and we move forward to make decisions. Now, we can't turn these things off. They are always on. They are always turned on. And so as we retire, we don't stop getting inputs that make us think in a particular way or behave in a particular way. So we always need to be conscious of the fact that this thing in between our ears, this three-pound spongy mass, the human brain, is always on, always taking it, it data in, and is always putting out uh, or pushing outputs out. And if we stop taking care or not focusing on what is coming into our brain, we can easily find ourselves on a path in retirement that could lead us to a place we may not want to go to. So, you know, so meaning and purpose and keeping an eye on what's going on or being conscious of what's going on inside our brain um, are the biggest challenges I think people face in retirement. And that, by the way, was my succinct answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> there's so many strands to go down. I'm, I'm going to pick on a few. I mean, it, it reminds me of, I, I played on golf um, mm. and, and I'm a, 
I'm a, a, a kind of a fan of golf history and, and, and one quote has stuck with me for years and, and Jack Nicholas said once said that the hardest six inches in golf are the six inches between your ears um, right. and, and, and it's uh, you know I think the hardest six inches in retirement are the six inches between your ears and I think so many people spend so much time focusing on what they are going to retire to they actually don't realize what they're retiring from and the identity that they have created in their lives through their career. And so I think one of the real things that we see as eye-opening when we work with, with people is getting them to explore what they're retiring from. So, you know, what are the non-financial aspects of work that you love and that you're going to miss? Because that sense of an identity is one that really we should try and replace or work to replace when we go into retirement. And in a modern world, I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of the impact of social media that, that that's ha- but actually we've got an ability now in our retirement to be more connected than we've ever been to our past. So we can yeah. remain connected to friends and work colleagues and et cetera um, th- through social. So I think it's a really interesting challenge, right, that, that, that we face. It is, Dan, but there's another, there's another challenge, if you like, to layer on top of the challenges that we've just talked about over the last two minutes. Meaning and purpose, right? So, so who we are and our place in the world is a human trait. It's been with us since day one. Every single human being wants to feel part of a, a, a part of a, a clan, a group, a, a crowd, whatever, a tribe. Tribe, tribe. That's yeah, that's yeah, the big word. Isn't it? Yeah. Everybody, everybody wants to have a sense of meaning. Everybody mm-hmm. wants to have a place in the world. That's that's a very human thing, yeah. right? That's just it's, it's almost hardwired into the human brain to do to do those things. There's actually parts of the human brain which actually deal with a lot of what I've just said. They are there are functions in the brain that are evolutionary wired to do those things. Retirement is a made up thing. We made it up. Yeah. At some point in the human history, yeah. somebody said, I'm going to create a word called retirement. Yeah. And what that is, it's a line in the sand and after which people don't need to work. Yeah. It's made up. So the they, human they, brain therefore has to process it as yeah. a made up thing, which yeah. going against the internal conversations of our evolution. And so there's this kind of conflict going on all the time. And sometimes I don't think we address that either. And and that that made up thing wasn't made up that long ago, right? So what, what I think it was, I think I, I read the other day that the first kind of social payments were made in Germany in the late 1800s. The state, the, the kind of social security happened in the UK in the, was it 1908 or 1909? That was only designed for people that were, you know, that couldn't work and were ill. And it only lasted for, you know, maybe 12, 18 months because as soon as you couldn't work, you pretty much then ended up dying, right? That was kind of, That's we right. didn't retire. So kind of this modern day retirement is not even a hundred years old. So we're one or two generations into something. And in fact, it's, it's gone up a level in the last generation of people retiring. Hmm. You know, my granddad retired and sat on the chair and had a pension that give him a, income that he had to live to now this modern retirement is one that is completely different to that right so completely and you know there's you've got retirement made up money is in essence a human invention right so it's not in essence it is a human invention and so you've got the brain this human old kind of you know hundred thousand year old brain trying to get to grips with money as an invention and then a dynamic within that saying, now you need to take a bit of that money and move it over here because we have this thing called retirement that you need to think about. And the brain goes, man, that's a lot of information to process, given everything else I need to process on a day-to-day basis. So I'm not surprised that you know people like you who do an amazing job helping people navigate this landscape sometimes come up against people who struggle to make important decisions when it comes to their futures and their retirement. So, so if we let, let's circle back to purpose and identity. So, so I think we do agree that one of the biggest challenges out there is purpose and identity 
kind of post work or life after work as as it, you know as as we say because again given everything we've talked about i think i'm not a massive fan of the word retirement i think it does have negative uh implications on people's mindset now so this kind of life after work doesn't necessarily mean or life after career doesn't mean that you're never going to work again right it, it, so it's about purpose so how do you how do you think that we could and the listeners that are at a stage of life that are thinking about this retirement how do you think we could start to prepare ourselves as human beings to continue to have purpose and identity post work you need to you, you you've got to start as soon as you possibly can this isn't a when i retire i'll find purpose you know so outside of your working environment you need to try and find those things that make you get get out of bed you know and, and that could be as simple as you know, let me use me as an example, right? I absolutely love barbecuing, right? Lo- love it. I've got a proper, authentic charcoal barbecue at every opportunity when the sun's out. The sun's out now, by the way. It's about one degree, and now right, my yeah. brain goes, ooh, I could barbecue something today. <laughs> um, but for me, sitting on a beach with my wife and my little dog with a barbecue is like, it's that's heaven, right? That is my, oh, my God, I love my life moment. I I, I really do. Within there, there's purpose, right? Because actually, what I I want to be the best barbecue. I want. I read books. I watch programs about it. I try and I read. I read everything about the best charcoals to use that re- retain the best heat. All of that type of stuff, right? Talk, talk about made up it, industries. That is something that's taken off massively, right? <laughs> it, it really has. I know because of me. Um, yeah. And they see my pictures on Twitter and go, "I want to do that too." No, so it's yeah. it's this is it's it's a seemingly silly and simple example, but it's not because actually I wake up and the sun's shining and immediately my brain is wired to go, Oh, this thing excites me. This thing makes me happy. I want to do this thing. Now we, that might be going to see the kids. It might be going to watch a football match, a soccer match. It might be, it it might be going for long walks with your friends. It might be going to the pub for food. It could be a whole host of things. It doesn't need to be a thing. I'm not saying purpose is a thing like work. It could be a whole host of many little things that when you put them together actually fills your week very easily, you know? So we all do these things on a day-to-day basis whilst we are in our working life, but we just don't tend to label them as being an element or an ingredient in our purpose or our or, or giving us meaning. And so I would say to people, spend the time to sit and think, what makes you happy? What makes you content? What do you love doing? And no matter how small that is, write it down somewhere because these become, it's like a recipe book using that analogy. These become the ingredients of what a good, a life well lived looks like. How do you build a life well lived after I retire? There's all your ingredients. Go barbecue, go to the football, go to the theater, go for long walks with your friends, go to the pub once a week and have a lovely meal, drink a nice bottle of wine. All of these things combined give you a sense of meaning and purpose. So it's not one thing. It's a whole host of many little things. And I think people like you, Dan, when you have conversations with clients through questioning and exploring their stories, their life stories with them, you can draw out those little ingredients that perhaps are hidden from view and help them construct the most amazing recipe for retirement. I'm nicking that. Recipe for retirement. Trade you can have it, it's yours. Um, thanks. Um, Happy birthday. <laughs> I think that's amazing. I think that, look, there's a massive takeaway in there for me that it's a couple of takeaways. Preparing early is important. I think we don't, because we in general are working and are busy being busy, um, we don't give enough airtime or mental capacity or headspace to actually think about what is important to us and what makes us happy. And as you said, I think those conversations I have with people are ones that we come out the other side and and the feedback is often, I didn't realise that it was the little things that made me happy. I didn't realise it was those, you know, we often focus on the big thing of work and we give little airtime to understanding what that once we've got time on our side, what the little things actually bring a smile to our face. Um, and I think that's really important to to establish doing it early and really thinking about what 
going back to basics because I think you know as, as human beings we're, we're quite um, we're quite basic animals and if we go back to basics it does actually throw up a lot of simple things done well done with intention actually does result in a really really happy retirement for people yeah that's right and you know the problem is dan is that we get in our own way sometimes because we're mm. so we're, we're so busy being busy yeah that we sometimes don't stop to savor every moment truly you know we don't kind of we don't stand on the beach looking at the castle in the distance and kind of just look at it and go I'm just going to save this moment. I'm going to smell the air, feel the sand under my feet, feel the sun on my back, look at the castle and go, oh, my God, this moment is incredible. We don't do it. We're so busy being busy that we go, oh, that's amazing. Let me take a quick picture of that. Move on. Let's go to the next thing. And so, not so, but if we sit and think, consciously sit and think about what in my life, what in my life brings me joy, what makes me happy, what makes me content, and you think back through your story, you know, what you do is you start to find threads. You start to realize that standing on the beach, looking at the castle. Oh my God, I love that moment. Sitting on a beach, having a barbecue. Oh my God, I love that moment. Walking by the sea when I'm feeling a little bit anxious and just getting the iodine flooding into my body and my brain starting to relax. Oh my God, I love that moment. You start to see, oh, actually, do you know what? I lived in the, I, I need to live near a beach because actually there's a thread here. Every time I'm near the sea, I am, I am happy. I am content. So there's something that I need to work towards in my retirement. Unless you have these conscious conversations with yourself or with an advisor or with a friend, I don't care who it is, it's just as long as you have the conversation, you struggle to kind of draw out these little moments in your life story that are clear signs of what you potentially should be thinking about doing when you retire. So it's a conversation, exploration. It's, it's, everything's there to waiting to be discovered. And I think, look, that that is, for everyone listening, that is the reason why I exist and set this podcast up effectively, because I think we try and make retirement a maths equation, and we try and make it all about the numbers. And, and one of my favorite little sayings that, uh, I don't know whether it was you or a future guest on the podcast, Brian, uh, your colleague said, but uh, human beings are storytellers, not calculators. That was Brian. And I think, yeah. and I think so. I'll, 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 I'll weed that out of Brian when I speak to him on 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 on, an, on a future episode. Um, but I do think that we focus so much on the numbers, and we 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 lose that sense of what true well being gives us in, in retirement. Um, and yeah, I think that you know people come to us because they think we're going to deliver some sort of maths equation and get huge light bulb moments when we don't talk about numbers for three or four meetings because it's so unimportant. It's, you know, the numbers are irrelevant if we don't know what our purpose and identity is going to be. If you can't take advantage of your numbers, what's the point? Exactly right. And at Shaping Wealth, you know, we have this phrase, a, a, a phrase of funded contentment, which is underwriting a life that is meaningful to you. So what does that really mean? It means, you know, working towards having enough cash in your bank to do the things that you want to do that make you happy and make you content. So go back to me as an example. It's the easiest example for me to give. If I love sitting on a beach so much with, you know, barbecuing with my wife and my dog, if that is for me kind of like, oh my God, it's the holy grail of contentment, then I need to think, how do I do more of that when I retire? And I look at that and I think it costs me a bag of charcoal, a bottle of wine and a bit of meat. <laughs> You know, that's it. I don't need eight million quid in the bank. To There's do your that. funded contentment list. Me, that's the point. That's the point. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's the point. I don't. Yeah. And I, so what we do is we we sometimes get stuck on this kind of almost like a the hedonic treadmill, if you like, of just constantly going and trying to get more, and then you get more and you want more, without stopping and realizing. Hang on a second. How much do I really need to live a life of contentment and happiness? And it's for many people, I would argue, it is not multi millions of pounds. It really isn't. You know, I could, and, and I and I get that I'm slightly different. I could live in a small, well built beach shack. You know, as long as I've got a bedroom and a, and a bit of a place to work, and a, you know, and it's nice on a beach, it doesn't need to be big at all. 
And as long as I can access the sea and I can access the sand and I can go to the shop and I need to go to the shop and I'm near society to a degree, I'm actually not asking for a lot. I'm not asking for a six-bedroom mansion in 75 acres of land that has a triple garage so I can park my Ferrari and my Bentley. I'm, that is not – people. sometimes people think that's what successful retirement is, and it is so not that. A successful retirement is you living a life of contentment. It's you waking up every day and doing things that make you happy and going to bed at night feeling like you've just lived the best life you can possibly live. That is what successful retirement looks like. It is not about having, it's not about how much money you have in the bank. Yes, that's a factor. I get it. But it's not the be all and end all factor in, in the retirement story. I think for everyone listening, pause there and hit that little like circle with the arrow 30 second back thing and hit that and go back and listen to that again because that is unbelievable wisdom that everybody needs to hear. So thank you, Neil. That that was amazing. I, I actually drew something today and put it out on social media that, that that had three circles and it was kind of this massive circle that says what the world tells me is enough, a mm. circle within that circle that says what I think is enough, and then a little circle within that circle that says, actually, this, this is what's enough. Yeah. And everybody that I work with, bar none, in fact, when we get to the nuts and bolts of what's most important to them, what their purpose and identity is, that enough figure or that enough feeling is so much less than what they thought it was ever going to be. So yeah, it is. I think it really, just, it, yeah. it really is. And, and you know, mate, one of the things, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you this story very quickly. I'm on my third business, you know, shaping wealth. You know, I'm the co-founder with, with Brian Portnoy and, and Joy Leary. Joy, uh, Brian founded the business. Joy and I joined Brian. Um, it's my third business, in essence. I've, before this, I had two businesses that were that were mine, um, startup businesses, all in the human behavior space. And every single time, people have said to me at some point, "I bet you can't wait until you sell it for fifty million, sixty million, twenty million, ten million, whatever." And I kind of go, "It's not what I'm doing it for." And they they kind of go, "Oh, really?" What, what, what do you mean you're not doing it? What are you doing it for? And my genuine, honest, truthful answer is, I'm doing it to leave a legacy. I want to leave this earth having left a mark on it. doesn't matter how small. If I can change one person's life and that one person, you know, th their changes impact their family and then the next generation are impacted by that change, that for me is success. And I will die a happy man if I can achieve some form of legacy attached to me it's the money is a, the money is a bonus it genuinely is a, a, an, an added bonus right do i want to get paid of course i do i still need to pay my bills i've still got a mortgage and all of those things that i have to pay for of course i get need to get paid but money is not the reason i get out of bed in the morning i sit at my desk and work as many hours as i possibly can in the hope that i will make a difference in the world and leave a legacy and and I think sometimes we need to sit down as part of the retirement story and think actually what's what is it I want to achieve here, you know is it gazillion pound in the bank fine if it is I'm not saying that's wrong, um, or is it to leave a legacy is it to make a difference in the world and you realise that when you're back to your story when you then analyse that through the lens of enough, it's not as big as you think it is. I'd love to just touch on a bit of your expertise and we, we don't need to kind of dig into the well of the human brain because we could spend hours. Um, but for the, just for the next couple of minutes and, and before we kind of hit the home straight here, what, what, what kind of, what does go on then in our brain? What, what are the, what are the things that, you know, that scientific research now has obviously has come on so far. We know so much about how our brains are wired and react to these situations that we face ourselves in, what what are those kind of emotions and, and and behaviors that sit behind this kind of transition out of work and into 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 a retirement? Could you could you could we spend a couple of minutes on that? Gosh, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> well, pick yeah. one thing. I mean, we, we can't spend a couple of minutes. I might yes, need to get no, back. On, you might need to come back on at some point in the future <laughs> and do a specific lesson on what goes on in people's brains. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's do this in a whirlwind way. So, number one, 
the human brain is, in essence, a data gathering machine, and it uses the data that it receives in order to predict what is about to happen in the world. That's that's a, that's a basic function, right, of the brain. In other words, I took, I, I'm listening to you. My brain is processing the words, and those words are creating a, 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 a perception, my reality. But what those words are also doing at the same time is generating and creating emotion in me. So we, you know, we are the creator of our emotions based on the data that we receive into our brain. So if we look out the window and we see what we perceive to be a threat, right? The data input is our, into our visual cortex. The human brain processes that data. It goes threat and it generates an emotion, fear, anxiety, whatever that, that emotion is in response to the data coming into the brain. So our emotions are constantly, they're like the tide, they ebb and flow constantly based on the data that's coming into the human brain. So in a working world, the majority of data coming into our brain is from our working lives, right? The people we mix with, the job we do, the expertise we build, up, the mastery that we have that, that, that we are working towards. When we flip, flip into retirement, the data input is very different. A lot of the data input that I've had for 30 years vanishes and new data comes into the brain. So the brain, in essence, has to relearn what those signals mean. And it, and it needs to adapt to those signals, to the new data. That might throw up new emotions. It may throw up new feelings that people have never had before. And they may go, oh, what does this mean? How, why am I feeling like this? Know this. It is all perfectly normal. That is how the human brain has worked for millions of years. You know, it takes in data and it generates a response, a, a, a response that is um, based on the, the, the data that it that it's receiving. So, retirement will feel, from a cognitive brain perspective, different to your working life because it is different because the inputs are different. That's fine. You just need to learn to adapt to what those signals mean and and respond accordingly. That's one thing. But you know, that's that's number one. Number two is. We also need to be conscious and aware that, you know, back down to when we talked about money being a new invention, retirement being a new invention. If you go back, if we go back to the beginning, like five and a half million years ago, you know, when we climbed out of trees and became bipedal, walked around on two legs. If we take that as our period of time, for the majority of the time as a species, we have lived in what is known as an immediate return environment. In other words, if it rained, I took shelter. If I was hungry, I, I ate. So whatever happened, I just did it there and then. You know, No such thing as refrigeration, all of those things that we love today. None of that happened over the last 5 million years, really. And so that species, that part, that, that part of our journey was all about immediate reward. If, it, if we needed to do it, we just did it. We now live in what is known as a delayed return environment. In other words, we have to do we do things today where the benefit won't be, um, or, or the benefit is in some at some future point. Retirement is the classic example. Telling a twenty year old save your money today for something that you're going to hopefully experience when you're seventy. Those words, that data input, right? That's data. That data goes into the brain. And the brain kind of goes, hang on, for 5 million years, I've done everything immediately. If I wanted it, I just did it. And so there is this constant kind of evolutionary conflict going on of the brain going, I come from an immediate return environment, mate. Stop telling me to save for something that might never happen. <laughs> and it's why there is this constant conflict between our present self, you know, the Neil and the Dan today, and our future self, the Neil and the Dan in 20 years time. There's this constant conflict because intellectually, we know what the right thing is to do for our futures because we are more intelligent, we, you know, we are wealthier, healthier, and wiser than we've ever been in the history of mankind. And yet we struggle, right? So people say, you need to save today for the future. And intellectually, you go, I, I know. But there's something in here that's going, ah, but I don't want to do this. I don't want to, I want to buy the new iPhone. It's just come out. It looks amazing. You know, I want to do this. I want to, I want to go on holiday. I want to do this. So number one, we've got this data input and it, it shifts. Number two, the brain is wired for this immediate return. So if you kind of, you know, people listening to this, your, your, your clients and, and, and the more broader audience, 
if you were making a decision that is future based, but you get this urge just to, oh, that's difficult. I just want to do this now. Know that that is normal. That's how we've been wired for a long, 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 long time. And we can't just flip a switch and, and tell the brain to now think differently. So, you know, the, I, I think, Dan, I'll stop on those two. Those two things are quite That's important yeah, things yeah. to think about. But the one that I would say people need to be really conscious of and not beat themselves up over is the first thing. When you retire, your landscape changes, your data inputs change. Therefore, don't expect the same outputs at, at all. Just be conscious that the world's different and just take time to just go with the groove. Just go, okay, I'm going to learn what retirement feels like for me. Um, okay, that's a new feeling. Interesting. What does that mean? What does that signal tell me? How do I respond to that? Um, the, the, the mistake people make is thinking that the data inputs are going to remain the same throughout the, all of their life, yeah. and therefore the outputs will always be the same, and that's yeah. just not true. It's not how we work. Amazing. I mean, that, uh, look, uh, so many light bulb moments there for me again, and and hopefully for the listeners. That, I mean, that that just, you know, the phrase I use a lot is that the plan is wrong the moment it's created. Ongoing planning is is kind of, you know, because life changes and tomorrow, we don't know what tomorrow brings. And the journey is more important than the destination because the destination will probably never be arrived at because it changes all the time, right? So, you know, that those those inputs to outputs is a constant is a constant change. Amazing. So look, as we wrap this up, and we're probably going to recap a little bit about what we've talked about, but I'd love to ask you what I'm dubbing. I love chocolate. My favorite chocolate bar is the Toblerone. Um, so what oh. I've... No? Oh, no. Nah, not really. Uh, okay. Um, it's nice. So... It's nice, but get stuck in your teeth. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, so what, I, what I'm labeling as the Toblerone of truth. So I've got three questions that I want to ask you, if that's all right. See where I'm going then? See where I'm going? Yeah, total around the truth. I like this. I like the alliteration. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we've already covered some of this, but I just want you very, in the next couple of minutes before we wrap up, just short, sharp answers to these be amazing. So, yep. and I think I know where this is going to go. Neil, what will your retirement look like? Warm weather, sitting on a beach, relaxed. I don't think I will ever stop working. Because I find too, I get, I take too much joy in understanding what's going on inside people's brains. So I don't think I'm ever going to stop working per se. But I, I would like to think that I take my foot off the accelerator quite a lot and just end up sitting on, sitting down, chilling out, eating good food, and just watching the world go by. I love doing that anyway. So um, my retirement, a bit of work, but incredibly slow and chilled. Amazing. Can I join you on some of those beach barbecues? Too right, too right. Awesome. Um, and and when it comes to emotions and behaviours around our money, can you give me what you believe is either well, either or really the most positive and or the most negative um, emotions or behaviours that either you display or you see in others? Is there one that or two that you could just cover off quick? <sighs> I want to. Am I allowed to challenge you? You can. Absolutely. As long as, it's not, as long as it's not too hard. I, won't, I, I would never be hard on you. I, I, I struggle with the word positive and negative, and I'll tell you why. Because the way the human brain works and the way it develops emotions, they are responses to the signals coming in, and they are the brain's best guess at, at how to deal with the data coming in. You know, we, people don't sit and go, right, I'm going to respond emotionally in a negative way to what I've just seen. They don't do that. The brain's already just decided that for them. So... Whilst an emotion may lead to an outcome that is less than optimal, um, I've always struggled with labeling things positive and negative because I think it it gives people the wrong sense. It gives people a sense that the way that they, their brain has naturally worked is wrong, and it's not. It's right for them in, in the moment. So that that's it's, it's not a challenge per se. It's just a clarification, I guess, on a point. And it's why I often struggle with this question when people say, "Tell me about positive and negative emotions," and you can go sadness, anger, wrath. They're all negative and happiness and joy and fun. They're all positive. Um, and I get that, right? I get that classification. What I tend to see based on emotions and how people respond to the data coming in um, are, are, are three things that we tend to do that that can get fall on the more negative side, if, if you like. The first one is um, self-sabotage. 
So, you know, we kind of, we have an emotional response and we kind of go, oh, I'm not going to do this or I'm going to do this other thing instead. And even though you know the right thing to do, you do the thing, the, the opposite, because you feel or you perceive it to be a better solution. And, and we sabotage our own futures and our own happiness um, far too easy sometimes. That's number one. Number two is, you know, we, we may have a, an emotional response that tells us, right, I need to do these things, but we're also surrounded by other people and we integrate into their lives. And we can easily be led by peer pressure. So example, if I want to go to the gym, um, I start going to the gym more often, but all of my mates are going out to pubs and having meals and drinks and stuff, and that's all I'm exposed to, then it becomes really hard for me to ignore the peer pressure of them saying, just come with us and, and just go out on my own to, you know, to, to, to do what I need to do, go to the gym. Um, and the third thing is you know, kind of the environmental architecture, if you like. So if I want to make important decisions about my retirement, then I need to be conscious of the environment in which I'm in. And is that environment allowing me to self-sabotage? Example I use all the time when I talk about this is if you're trying to cut down on the donuts and you go to the same coffee shop every morning that bake fresh donuts, you're going to find it really hard to cut down on the donuts. You need to find another coffee shop. You know, So the environment in which we place ourselves in also can create this kind of this negative outcome, if you like, or less than optimal outcome. So, so those three things are on the are on the negative side. On the positive side, I tell you the one thing, you know, people, when you go through what we've talked about today, when you sit down and you refine the ingredients to to write that recipe for retirement, that brings you just such a sense of joy and happiness, and oh my god, this feels amazing, and and that generates a whole host of, a whole host of positive emotions in us. Um, so for me. When it comes to money, when it, you know, I don't think people exhibit per se negative or positive emotions, but they they generate emotions in their head that lead them to actions, and those actions can have a negative or a positive outcome based on how people implement or use the data and the outputs from the human brain. So I think that makes sense. Amazing answer, and I've been taken to school, so love it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Love it, Not absolutely love it. No, amazing. And I think that, that we, we've had, just, just quickly, we've had conversations previously about, you know, hating the word irrational because we are all mm-hmm. perfectly rational in our decisions, right? So it kind of leads into that. So um, uh, amazing. Last question before we wrap up. So I'm 55 and I've established that I've got enough money uh, for the retirement that I desire. What would be your number one tip for a happy, healthy and wealthy retirement? I'm going to steal a line from somebody else. Years ago, years ago, I stood and watched a UK financial planner who then went on to found the Institute for Financial Wellbeing, Chris Budd. I watched him at a conference and he said, if you want to be happy in life, or if you want, he was talking about wellbeing. And he said, what you need to do is find out what makes you happy and spend your money on that. I'll never forget that line. Find out what makes you happy and spend your money on that. And it's almost like never a true a true words being spoken. You know, so you're 55, you've got enough money in the bank. Just find out what makes you happy and don't spend your money on that. Amazing. Do that thing. You know, you, you know this, right? It's a well it's a well trodden cliche, it's a well trodden phrase. You know, life isn't a rehearsal. This is it. You've only got one chance, blah, blah, blah. It's true. So find out what makes you happy. Spend your money on that and live a life of happiness and contentment because you've only got one of them and you never know when it's going to end. You know, so just live a life. I mean, gosh, imagine that. Just figuring out what makes you happy and just spending your money on that and waking up every day with a smile on your face and going to bed every night feeling satisfied with a smile on your face. How amazing would that be? What an amazing way to wrap up a wonderful, wonderful episode of the podcast. Neil, um, a massive thank you for me for your time and wisdom. Um, An amazing conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for for listening to the Humans vs. Retirement podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, Until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Humans vs. Retirement podcast. Subscribe to be notified when new episodes become available. We would love to have you along for the journey. If you like what you heard, 
then we would appreciate you taking a few minutes to leave us a review. And lastly, if you want to explore your retirement plans further, download our free seven-step retirement GPS toolkit linked in the show notes. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of TFP or Dan Haylett. This content is not intended to be a substitute for professional advice, so please always seek the advice of professionals with any questions you may have regarding your retirement.